my heartfelt congratulations to you graduating seniors as you complete your studies in one of the most challenging times we've ever experienced, at least during my lifetime. I've been impressed with the innovation that Fairview schools have shown during this COVID-19 crisis, as your teachers went from being a full-time classroom to basically online learning teachers, but they had the help of your impressive learning management system, B-Ed, very impressive. Your test results showed that you really didn't skip a beat and 80% of your parents were confident enough that you all did well in adapting to online learning. The fact that 100% of you scored 31 or higher on your IB diploma puts you above the IB average worldwide. And your average score of 37.3 in 2020 puts Fairview in the top 50 global IB diploma program schools. Now these results were not caused solely by, due to the bright and capable students that you all are, but speaks to the quality of your teachers and your school overall. The ISC's International School Awards announced that your teachers and your school were the winners of their Teaching and Learning Award, and that your principal, Dr. Vincent, was recently awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award for Educational Excellence. I believe that you are among the very few of today's top students who have aimed high from a surprisingly early age. Think about it. Aspirational teenagers like you were, when you were just 15 or 16, they're already planning their way to the top universities and a future career with the big name multinational corporations. This is particularly true for students from Malaysia, but also other Asian countries who make it their priority to achieve their full potential in school and in preparation for the best university and career opportunities. Your parents' choice of an IB International School in this case uh, set the expectation for you from a very early age. Your parents were very wise to provide you with this opportunity to study an international curriculum and become a global citizen. They know that in today's world you need more than just academic knowledge. You also need language and life skills to be successful anywhere. This is what will give you your competitive advantage. You and your competitive peers are now the ones setting the bar for both aspiration and achievement. But always be humble. Have the wisdom to recognize the best in others while always demanding the best from yourself. All of you are now headed for university which is a good time to set goals and devise a plan. Remember, failing to plan is planning to fail. You need a roadmap, but be prepared for unintended detours, confusing signs and closed roads. Don't be afraid or unwilling to change. Enjoy the journey wherever it takes you because it's your life. Be prepared to occasionally fail because that's what successful people do. They learn from it, they grow from it and they take action from that learning. I know that COVID has meant that graduation looks a little different for you than you expected, but the achievement is still there. You've put in the same hard work and you've learned and grown from the experience. So congratulations on your well-deserved success and best of luck to you and your journey going forward. Pendant child. We're pleased to have all of you join us this morning. But before we begin, just a few meeting etiquettes to go through. So I see that all of you have joined the meeting. Well done. Secondly, we appreciate if you would mute your microphone and we would um, to give you a better webinar experience together. Please pay attention to the presenters. We have two today. And if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box okay, and I will channel them to our speakers at the end of the webinar. And if you're called, kindly unmute yourself so that we can hear you. Although you can type, but we really much appreciate um, if we could have that conversation with you to find out more about the context of a question as well. So once again, thank you, every one of you. Uh, for joining us today and observing the meeting etiquette. So I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We have 
Dr. Vincent Chen. He is a medical graduate and a former psychiatrist registrar. But over the last 18 years, he taught from biology to various subjects, inspired a science department that he led, the IB Diploma Program, and championed holistic education as our principal. Under his leadership, the IB Diploma at Fairview handed out over 2 million in scholarships and achieved an average, a cohort average result of 37 out of 45 points. So really well done. He was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by Kingsley Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific for Educational Excellence this year in 2021. So thank you, Dr. Vincent. And next we have another speaker, Ms. Eswari. Okay, Ms. Eswari is our middle years program, in short, we call it MYP coordinator at Fairview International School, Penang. She has 20 years of experience in teaching and five years in pedagogical leadership. Okay, she is a graduate in computer science. She believes the key strategy for learning lies in self-motivation and self-discipline. So indeed, very apt uh, panel speaker for our topic today. Welcome, Ms. Swari. So without much further ado, Dr. Vincent, take us away. Thank you very much, uh, Sukian. Uh, glad to be here. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for spending a Saturday morning with us. Uh, it's 11.09, and we are hoping to finish this at 12 o'clock. Uh, it, it may run a little bit, so do forgive me if it does, but we'll try and get through this as efficiently and as practically as possible, and make sure you get some really strong takeaways. So just before we begin, I'd like everybody to put into the chat box a response, okay? On a scale of 1 to 10... How much do you feel the problem of independence connects to you and your life on a scale of one to 10, one being nothing at all and 10 being lots. So punch in a number into the chat box now. All right, let's uh, let's wait for some numbers to come through. Oh, there we go. We can say, ooh, big numbers coming through. Big numbers. Wow. Tens and nines and eights. Oh, lots of eights and nines. All right. Thank you very much for starting us off. Uh, yeah, keep them coming, guys. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm an educator, so we like to do things in a very organized way. We're going to start with a map of what we're going to be doing. So we're going to start out with what's the big problem today with our kids and their dependence issues. Then we're going to move into the underlying problem philosophy so that we explain about, you know, what, what do we need to understand about independence in order to get started on this journey? We get three practical tips on what we can do at home straight away to get, get moving on our independence journey. And finally, we do what do we do every day in the IB for every learner in Fairview? So first question, uh, Ms. Eswari, help us out here. What is the big problem? Why, why do we need to bother about this independence thing? Is it really a big deal at all? Okay, hi everyone. Uh, well, I can speak from my experience and I understand these issues. So I've come across many individuals uh, from traditional learning environment and I've also received students from different educational setting which focus on a traditional approach. and they do as they are told. So it takes a long time to unlearn this. So teaching, they are always given directions. Uh, for example, uh, students would sit in silence while one student after that, and they were expected to study and memorize Oh, absolutely. I can relate. My, my teacher used to just ask me to read out of the textbook. You read the first paragraph and you read the second one. It was the worst, most boring time of my life when I went through that. Yeah, exactly. And followed by this, they will be answering questions. And there's only one right answer to these questions. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely. So this will result in grown-ups who are spoon-fed. They are unable to form opinion independently. So when they go out to the real world, like their workplace or larger group settings or even in meetings, they tend to play very safe yep. and rather not utter a word at the risk of sounding unintelligent. So that's bring us to the problem and the question, if this is the adult that we want to raise? Yeah, I would say no, absolutely not. Yeah, I mean, I, I can totally connect, you know, that's exactly the kind of person that I don't want in my teaching staff at all. You know, we're, we're in a meeting together and I say, anybody have any ideas or opinions and everybody's just too terrified to say anything at all um, because it's exactly what you said. They are afraid of sounding unintelligent or getting the one wrong answer, not saying the one right answer as they've been drilled for the last 13 years or more of their education. That, that's, that's definitely very relatable. Yeah. So that's why we are here today and we are going to share some practical tips. Okay, right. We're gonna to move to the next part. The next section we're gonna do is, what is the underlying philosophy? How do we get started on this conversation of independence? What do we need to understand first before we get going? Because it's always important, we need to understand the fundamentals. And the fundamentals of independence uh, is the concept of agency. Agency, ownership, these two words are very commonly interrelated. So I'll just explain it. Um, if you have low agency, uh, if, if, if Mrs. Shwari has low agency, what she's going to do, is she's going to comply with everything. And that's all she's going to know how to do. She's going to basically just say, yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'll do whatever you say. Yes, sir. No, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Done. And that's compliance. And gosh, while it may make life easy for us as adults, kids with compliance have the life sucked right out of them and they are very uninteresting. Uh, and furthermore, when they go into the real world, they crumble really fast because they're always waiting for people to tell them exactly what to do. On the other side of that spectrum, when you have high agency on the right, you call this child the empowered child. That kid knows exactly what he wants to do. He's <laughs> He says, you say, can you please go do it? He says, no, I don't want to do that because I think I'd rather do this. And that kid knows what he wants to do. Often in our traditional setting, we'll say you are being um, rebellious and you're not listening to the authority. And these are exactly the kind of statements in traditional education that destroy a child's uh, sense of agency. You know, if a child says, I, no, can you please sweep the floor? If the child says, no, I don't want to sweep the floor. I want to do the, the whiteboard. Okay. Well, can you help me figure out who can sweep the floor then? Because we still need the floor swept, right? Uh, and, you know, work with them in that situation. Now, in order to get from compliance to empowerment, we need to engage the child constantly along the spectrum at every point from compliance all the way to empowerment. And it's very different as we go along. And you're going to see some of the examples coming through. The second very important thing that we need to understand is the stages of learning. And Parents, every parent, you got to pay attention to this one over there. Don't jump through the stages. There are four stages typically. You start by modeling first, role modeling, another way of saying that. Like, let's say you're going to teach, teach your child how to tie the shoelace. You tie the shoelace by yourself, and then you maybe tie it for them. Then we go to guidance where you say, okay, see, I'm going to put, put this one through this hole over here, and I'm going to give a bit of length over here, and I turn this knot like this. And then you gradually release. Hey, why didn't you try make the first knot? Yeah, that's it. Okay, why don't you try and make the loop? Yeah, and you release slowly more and more uh, as time goes on. And then finally you go and say, hey, why don't you go and try tying your own shoelaces? Big mistake that we always do. We jump from modeling straight away to independence and then we scold our kids for not succeeding. Can you see the problem there? So, parent... Uh, Sandra, I think you've got your mic going over there as well. Or do you want to participate in the conversation too? Um, so parent involvement uh, reduces as we go up this ladder and learner involvement increases, obviously. But one big takeaway for all of our parents out there is don't jump the steps from modeling to independence. Go through the stages slowly. Otherwise, you're setting your kid up to fail and they're going to jump right back into dependence because dependence means you tell me what to do and I'll go do it. I'm not going to take risk anymore because the moment I did the last time, you scolded me. All right. 
Now, let's go to some practical tips because that's what we're here for today. What do we need to do? What can we do right now that's going to make a big difference in our children's lives? We've got three areas of practical tips for you, parents. One, safe space and communication. Two, positive reinforcement. And three, developing decision-making skills and practice, practice, practice. So, Mr. Shwari, let's get us started. What do we need to do with regards to the safe space and communication concept? Maybe help us understand a little bit about the safe space too. Yeah. All right. To get started and address this problem, uh, I think we need to create a safe space where they will not feel like they are being judged, where they have the opportunity to talk, to ask questions and reflect. So what we need to do is to invest in a piggy bank of confidence. Uh, I would like to use the word piggy bank here. So let's look at it from a piggy bank perspective by giving them the safe space and uh, using non-judgmental communication, you are making deposits in form of confident coins in your teenager's piggy bank. So uh, I guess most of you might be wondering why this piggy bank and how the child is going to use this imaginary piggy bank. Uh, this piggy bank will come in very handy to your child in the future because at the end of the day, your child won't live in a safe space forever. They will need to go out to the world, take up jobs, meet people. So they need to rely on this piggy bank whenever they are facing challenging situations. So then this piggy bank will be very, very useful for them. Uh, let's say they face a challenging situation where they need to draw uh, and on their reserves of courage, like taking the initiative to answer a difficult question in class, or perhaps uh, try a new study method, or even maybe decide what they want to do after their high school. So at this point, they can withdraw and use these confident coins to persevere through their difficult times or the situations. You know, I, I, Mr. Schor, I really like the idea that you said the word piggy bank because it, it kind of indicates that there is a finiteness. Of, um, and, and what I'm very curious about is what happens when the piggy bank is empty and you're trying to draw on it? Like, I'm going to do something risky and my piggy bank is empty. What, what, what happens then? Oh, that's very dangerous situation. Uh, actually, we see this a lot. The child will look very passive, uh, withdrawn, and won't have any confidence to even offer their opinions or try new things. Uh, I'm mm. sure we don't want to do this, and we don't want this to happen. So invest in their piggy bank. Absolutely. I mean, I totally, I, I can totally relate to that because you see lots of kids who are like that. And, and sadly enough, you know, when I meet their parents on Parents' Day, you can tell that they've been making withdrawals all the time. And the kids' piggy bank is just so low, um, and, and you can you can see that I can really relate to this. So, you know, just at this point, uh, parents, are like, I want you to just uh, put down into the box, you know, whether do you do you connect with this piggy bank? Do you, have you can you understand the piggy bank and where your your child's piggy bank status in your child is? Uh, and uh, can can you give us a number from one to ten? Do you think your child's piggy bank is full, ten, or one empty? Just put something into the chat box and. Tell us what you think. Um, and by the way, guys, I think for most of my kids, I'm running at about a three and a four because I don't spend enough time investing in the piggy bank. So I probably put threes and fours in there, really. But what do you guys think? Put something down in the chat box about where you think your child's piggy bank is at right now from a one to a 10. One being completely zero and emptied out and 10 being super full and overflowing. All right. So just as we continue, um, what can we do to build our piggy bank? Oh, uh, Shantini, two, Chongwei Hall, three. Andreas, you are amazing at 10 million. I'm not sure whether there's such a thing, but uh, you must be doing a fantastic job, buddy. Uh, Vinotini, three. Thank you very much for that. that that's, that's beautiful. Thank you for being so honest uh, and, and responsive there. Irene, six. Adam, eight. Very nice. Very nice. Um, Mr. Shwari, 
what can we do to build our child's piggy bank? I mean, I, I don't want it to be empty. I know I'm running at three or four. I, I'm really worried now that I haven't done enough. What do I do? What do I do? Okay, as uh, parents, uh, we need to constantly invest in our child's piggy bank. I would say invest in your child's piggy bank at least twice a day. Mm. So, yeah, this can be little things uh, like reinforcing how they did something well. Go for small things, no need to be too big. It doesn't have to be big grand things to congratulate them about. Yeah. Uh, I can give you some example, uh, maybe like the child clean up the living room without being asked to do so. So this is an opportunity for you to build your piggy bank. So we can start very small. And uh, we can also recognize their choices as good choices, even when it differs from ours. And also explain that they don't have to think like you or even agree with you for you to value their opinion. Oh, that's a, that's a hard one. So, you know, uh, wear this T-shirt. Child says no. Uh, and you say, OK, well, what do you want to do? And then at that point, I'm supposed to value and they, they point out another shirt and I'm supposed to value their opinion, even though it's different from mine. So maybe something I could be saying at that point would be like, um, that sounds like a great idea. It's not necessarily what I would put on, but sure, it looks, it looks amazing. Congratulations or well done. Would that kind of make sense, Ashwari? Yeah, definitely. So you may use words like, I like the way you thought about that, or something like, uh, thanks for your suggestion when they give some suggestions. Or perhaps like, it's not what I would normally think of. I think you have a valid one. So these are something to give them confidence, will invest in their piggy bank. Absolutely. And, and I like the way that you set, set it up twice a day. And this sounds to me like a, a habit formation thing. Uh, going on so if you do it twice a day every day I can see how that slowly builds up over time you, you don't need to overdo it all in one day and go crazy I suppose isn't it exactly all right now let's move on to the second one uh, thank you very much everybody for your responses and we're, we're going to keep them going guys so get get your fingers ready on those keyboards okay so positive reinforcement uh, tell us a little bit about this and how we make this practical at home. I mean, it also sounded like you connected to the piggy bank with this earlier on as well, or you alluded to it at least. Yes, definitely. Uh, I, I think it goes without saying that to instill confidence and independence in your teenager, positive motivation and encouragement go a long way. So it's very essential that we highlight good behavior. So when we are talking about this uh, positive reinforcement, it means for independent behavior and not when the child is demonstrating a dependent behavior. So, and the second most important thing is praising your child for their actions or the challenges they overcome. And this must be done immediately and it's, it has to be in the right frame and on the spot. Uh, that's quite interesting. Um, you, you put two points there. One is yeah, praise, uh, re positively reinforcing them for the right kind of behavior, and then also uh, making sure that it's done on time. And I can see that I've done it uh, personally in the wrong frame because I kind of like congratulate my kids at the end of the, uh, the day or something. But, um, you know, uh, I can see I need to do it immediately. So if Johnny goes, if my son goes and cleans up the table, you know, when I didn't tell him to, I should say immediately, hey, well done, buddy, uh, on the spot, isn't it? And you, exactly. you've also, yeah. Uh, and you said something about independent, praise, positively reinforce the correct kind of behavior as well. So if they behave independently and do things without you having to tell them that, then you should positively reinforce that as opposed to obviously bad behavior like, Congratulations for being on the couch all day long. I mean, that would, that would be an obvious example of the opposite, isn't it? Exactly. I think it's very, very crucial to do this in a timely manner. So yeah. if the child is helping to cleaning up the table, maybe just stop right there and acknowledge and then give them some positive reinforcement. Mm. And, and uh, again, we've got this habit turning up again. Can you tell us a bit more about this? 
Um, my suggestion is to make it a habit and do it at least twice in a day and do it every day. Can I, can I kind of combine this with the first one, the, the piggy bank? Uh, sorry, the, the previous one, which is, uh, let's see, safe space and communication. So I'll combine it with this one and do that twice a day. Exactly. So we can circle back to the first point where we invest in our child's piggy bank of confidence as we do this. So when you positively reinforce good behavior, you are investing in their piggy bank of confidence and also give them direction on what independent behavior looks like. That's excellent. Uh, okay. Oh, we've got a big message from Andreas. Here's all. Congratulations, Andreas. And thanks for telling us that. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you for spending time with us, Andreas. It's a good thing you're listening in. And feel free to share with us a little bit about, your, about more yourself, okay? Um, right, let's go to the third one. Um, tell us a little bit about this de develop decision-making skills and practice it. What's this all about? Okay, I'm, I'm sure you agree with me that independent decision-making skill is an important life skill. So uh, you can help your child develop and practice them by inviting them as a partner when you're making decisions, at least once a week. So at the beginning, perhaps uh, you can maybe guide them with some steps, uh, like finding out about different options or talking about, about the pro and cons or even brainstorming uh, what to do if things don't go according to the plan. So this will give your teenager some tasks that are that, a uh, little bit challenging but still within the realm of what they can do. And uh, this will definitely help them to deal with frustration, solve problems, and also stick out challenging situations. Yeah, and especially if you role model for them, like how it was explained earlier, we always start with role modeling, right? Mm -hmm. So. If you role model for them how you deal with the same challenges, uh, it will definitely guide them. So you can acknowledge that something is hard and show them how you overcome the challenges. And then over time, you can shift from role modeling to guidance and gradually release them until they reach an independent state. No, oh, yeah, this really circles back to, you know, what we were talking about, the stages of learning. So doing things in stages rather than just throwing them into the deep end and hoping that they're going to sink or swim. Uh, yeah, I think this is a very important point for all our parents out there. Um, don't jump the steps. So you, one thing I tend to do with my kids, because I'm a banana, I don't know any Chinese. Um, I think somebody, oh, no, nobody... Uh, Andreas, your school is SJCPU. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a banana, so I don't know Chinese. And I got to show my kids who are learning Chinese as well that I don't know enough and I'm trying my best. And I have to show them how I fall and fail so that they can see uh, how I overcome challenge. So we have to role model and show them how we overcome problems um, and, and that decision making process, particularly. You know, how do we choose what to do for dinner? We got to walk through the steps with them so that they can see and understand what's going on. That's it's a good example that you've got. Yeah, I can give you more examples. Uh, uh, something like uh, making, invite them in the decision making. Uh, it can be like uh, as simple as buying groceries within a given budget or planning a weekend activities or even choosing uh, like what to eat for dinner. Mm. Uh, this will send a message that you value their input and also develop their decision-making skills. Yeah, for me, it's usually whether you want to sweep or mop the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so at least they get a choice about that. And they've got to figure out like, which one do I prefer? And why do we want to sweep or mop the floor? Uh, but yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying. The groceries is very interesting. So maybe I could give my kids like $10 or $20 and say, look, go buy some fruits. Uh, and tell me what fruit you want to spend on with these 20, this $20 and let them choose uh, and let them bear the consequences of their choice. And I've done that once or twice and the kids 
absolutely gobbled the fruits up that they chose, even though I'm pretty sure they tasted worse than the ones that I chose. Because it was their choice, it changed the whole game for them. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, right, so we've done... We've shared with you what, what's the big problem with our, uh, our kids today and their dependence. We've shared with you what are the underlying philosophies to really understand about dependence uh, and how and independence and how to overcome them about the stages of learning and of the concept of agency. We've also shared with you about some practical tips to nurture that independence in your child, safe space and communication. Remember, twice a day and that piggy bank, you got to keep filling up those coins positive reinforcement of the right kind of behavior in a timely way, right? And decision-making skills, practice that at least once a week, help your child and role model for them about how you would do those decision-making processes. Andreas, you're very active. You're Chinese? Cool, I hope you know Chinese. Why don't you type in the chat box whether you know Chinese or whether you can speak it? Then you're probably a, a little bit better than I am. All right. Now, uh, Ashwari, can you share with us so you're a, a teacher right now. How do you practice this in your IB program then? Okay. Uh, in our middle years program, uh, we create the safe space and non-judgmental communication through our classroom management skills. Uh, we encourage our students to share their ideas and opinions openly during class discussions. Uh, while we also encourage the peers to practice in responding in a non-threatening and non-judgmental manner. So uh, we don't subject our children to threatening situations by putting them on the spot to answer a question. That's called interrogation. Instead, we create curiosity and invite our students to offer their opinions through a process of inquiry. So most of the time, their answers just need a little fine tuning. And we do that by guiding them with some questions. Uh, let me give you a scenario. Uh, for example, um, like, is smoking good for you? So the child could answer yes, because it reduces stress. So our response could be, uh, so you suggested that smoking is good as it reduces stress levels. But what about the health effects after that? What that outweigh the benefits from, would that outweigh the benefits from stress reduction? Or something like, why don't you add that point to your response and try again? Uh, so mm. this will make the child to think about his answer and explore and research for more details. Yeah, I, I can definitely relate to that. Like in, in my classroom when I was young, it was just interrogation. What's the answer to this? What's the answer to this? What's the answer to this? And it's either right or wrong. And the teacher basically just glares at you menacingly if you got the wrong answer. Or he says, uh, okay, nice try, but you, smart student, go and answer the right questions to help this dum-dum. Um, and it was, it was just a process of humiliation. Every time the teacher started out on their questioning set, uh, it was just a process of humiliation. And um, I can tell you from my, my experience of interviewing lots and lots, hundreds of teachers for, to come to the school, a lot of teachers don't understand what the process of inquiry means. They think it is interrogation. Because when I ask them, tell me about inquiry, how do you do it? They basically describe interrogation and they think that that is inquiry. It's the biggest misconception. Um, so I'm really uh, very happy that you shared that we don't do that kind of thing in the IB classroom because we want to keep a safe space in there. Uh, I used to also be put, you know, you don't answer the right question, stand on a chair or the worst classic one. Everybody stand up and those who get the right answer sit down. That's another process of humiliation. Um, and so many classrooms um, still do that. IGCSE, SJKC, SJK all of them are still doing this kind of thing. And it's terrible. When you're done with that, a child feels um, demotivated, embarrassed, humiliated. And why is he ever going to try again if all you're going to do is make him feel bad? Sure, it makes one or two guys feel good about themselves. But is that really the point? Uh, is the point of education making one or two people feel good or helping everybody rise together? The rising tide lifts all boats, guys. Rising tide lifts all boats. Don't compare your kids. Don't humiliate them. 
And that's exactly what we are doing in our IB classroom through good classroom management skills. Okay, so thanks for that, Ashwari. Can you share us with us a little bit more about this? How do you do positive reinforcement in the IB classroom? Okay, for positive reinforcement, uh, we normally share a two minutes video praising good behavior or effort of the children. So this is done on a weekly basis. So we send out these videos to parents and students uh, appreciating what they have been doing. So we focus on positive reinforcement and also appreciate their effort. Mm. You know, um, I, I know this one well because you know I'm at the forefront of this in FISKL. And I know for a fact that we've sent over 300 videos to our kids, these little two minute snippets. Like Johnny, thank you very much. The other day I saw you picking up rubbish on the floor uh, and you know, when nobody was looking and I know you, you did it and you didn't bother waiting for anybody to say thank you and you just did it anyway. I thought that was an amazing act of integrity and responsibility. Um, and those kind of videos, we set so many of those things out. And the kids absolutely love it because they get that recognition. It's formal. Their parents can see it. They share it around all their family groups and it feels good. And the child, the next day, I tell you, you really think, if you, do you think that the child's going to pick up the rubbish on the floor the next day? Of course he will. He's going to do the right thing because we praised him and reinforced the correct kind of behavior. Um, and I see this uh, testimony uh, coming back from one of our parents uh, about, you know, uh, focusing on developing individual soft skills uh, and this letter of appreciation. I think, uh, can you share with us a little bit about this letter as well? Because I know we gave out about 250 of these green letters as well, alongside our positive videos. That's the kind of numbers we actually put out to all of our kids. Yeah, absolutely. So apart from these videos, we also give green letters. We call it letter of appreciation. Uh, when our students demonstrate good behavior, uh, we do give them, the teachers will write a reflection and then appreciate their behavior and we give this to students. So because we believe that everyone needs a little positivity in their life and constantly sending these little notes will really lift our children's spirits. I really love the fact that there's that little student comments reflection section because very often, you know, as Asians, when we receive compliments, we just brush it off and then let it go. Um, but you're not letting them do that in this case. You actually say you need to write your reflection on this compliment. Uh, and when they, you help them process that and give them the space and time to internalize that, hey, actually, I got, I got a letter of appreciation. My gosh, what do I need to do about that? And that really helps internalize that positive behavior as well. Uh, and that's what we do every day for every learner. Now, what do we do about decision-making skills? Oh, you got a robot in here. What's going on? All right. Uh, this is a very interesting project actually done by our student. Uh, so how we do this? Uh, we develop decision-making skills through inquiry-based teaching and learning in Fairview. So we invite our students to solve problems and determine what they need to do to learn to answer the problem. Wait, so, this is as opposed to telling them what to learn, right? <laughs> so we will bring them, we will lead them and facilitate in learning. Uh-huh. Yeah, so uh, uh, talking about this project, uh, we have a special project in IB called the personal project. Uh, this will be done in their final year, where students decide how to solve problem in their own way. So it's a big project where kids solve problem all by themselves, and uh, there is no right or wrong answer. So this example here, this is from one of my children, solve the problem of jungle wildfires by creating a project uh, involving drones to monitor them. She even made a prototype model of this drone uh, using Lego pieces to demonstrate the idea. Yeah. Mm. You so, know, I really love the fact that, um, you know, we, we're giving kids some space and time to really dig into something that they feel passionately about. Um, you, your child uh, solved a problem of drone uh, of wildfires in the forest. That's a very real world problem that hundreds of people get killed with every year, isn't it? Exactly. From my experience, uh, 
students will independently come out with brilliant ideas based on their personal interests, actually. Yeah, and when we give them the opportunity to solve real problems and the space to experiment, they really, really shine. Exactly. And uh, we also do this during our lessons. So the problem solving in our lessons, uh, I can give you an example. We involve uh, daily life lessons. For example, if they learn about uh, percentage and they also learn to calculate percentage of profit and loss. So we will then expose them to the situations like such as other strategies that you could implement to maximize your company's profit. So this will make the child to think how to solve the problem. Absolutely. I think when you make things real for them, all of a sudden, they'll be like, oh, actually, I can do something about this. You know, this is not just like in the math book anymore. This is something real now. And I can do something and this is going to affect my life. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I just want to connect back to this as well. I remember seeing a student. Uh, she was just walking around and she was holding her personal project journal. So, so when the kids do the personal project and they answer this real world problem, one of the big things they have to do is they've, they've got to write this big journal uh, and document their whole thought process and how they're going to do it. So, and so forth and tripped. And she was clutching the, the journal so tightly to the chest, everything else fell apart, all the rest of her books, but the journal she kept close. And I, I asked her, why, why did you do that? You know, And she said, this journal is more important than all of the books that I have because it's what I chose to do. And it's what I made and it's important to me. Uh, and this is an example of what happens when you give kids that choice, that voice and that agency when you give them the ability to choose for themselves, everything changes for them all of a sudden. It's, it's, it's so easy for us to just force them down a road, do this, do that. And you can get some really fast results out of that. But when the child chooses to do something and you don't judge them and you encourage them and you support them, wow, the difference it makes is astounding. Uh, and just one more thing to those people who don't know what the word inquiry means, inquiry is a way of teaching. So instead of your teacher going rah, 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 for the, the one hour of class is yabbering away at you, the teacher then sets up a problem and the students ask themselves, what do we need to know to solve this problem? And then we help them find out information to solve that problem. And that's called inquiry. Imagine if you're learning about things, uh, about the lungs and uh, maybe the bucket handle mechanism of the lung respiration and all that sort of thing and smoking and all the rest of the diseases. And, in, and that would be a super boring lecture, by the way. Um, but what if we turn that into, guys, there is a dead body on the floor and we have to investigate. You get to ask me questions about the body uh, for 10 minutes and then you got to go figure out what do you need to know to solve this problem and well if you do that you just see what happens to the kids faces they completely transform and that's the ib inquiry method or the not ib method is the inquiry method of teaching and learning that we use in the ib classes every day for every learner all right so what we've done so far um we've talked about the underlying problem and uh, with our kids and dependents and how that's a terrible thing. We've gone through those philosophies. We've talked about some practical tips to nurturing that independent child. Three practical tips there. Sorry, safe space, communication, and then developing uh, decision-making skills. And then we talked about how we do it every day in the IB for every learner. And we've given you some really tangible examples of how we apply these things in our classroom all the time. And as parents, what you can do is support us in the classroom by doing the same thing at home. So now we, I'm going to pass time over to Ms. Sukyen. Uh, thank you very much for listening in to us. Uh, just a couple of things from uh, Sukyen. Sorry, was listening very intently, well muted. Well, thank you, Ms. Eswari and Dr. Vincent. All right, I'll... As a parent of two myself, you know, I do need to be more intentional so in deep reflective thoughts on how I can work with my teen on building her confidence and partner with her on how to develop decision-making skills together. So I can see how this can lead to um, building her independence as she becomes a teenager and young adult eventually. 
Right. Uh, parents, students, and participants here, do you have any questions for Dr. Vincent or Ms. Eswari? Okay, please type it down at the chat box. As a teacher, I'm going to give you some think time. So you get some think time to consider, uh, reflect and consider what you like to ask. Uh, meanwhile, allow me to share with you information about our organizers. So Fairview International School is the top IB school in Malaysia. The school has won multiple awards, including the International Award in Teaching and Learning due to our toolbox, a very interesting toolbox. And five stars quality assurance title by the Malaysian government, as well as being one of the member of the Council of International Schools, CIS. Dr. Vincent, could you share with us more about our successes and accolades? Yep. Um, so a couple things for you. We are a school that uses the IB pedagogy. We teach in a completely different way to traditional education. We teach in a way that's meaningful, that makes sure your child is prepared for the future, not just another exam. The second thing you want to remember about us is we have this amazing program called the Future Proof Program at Fairview International School, which prepares your kids for the future by developing skills in them. Things like our amazing toolbox skills program are in there, our Falcons program, our Duke of Edinburgh program is there, co-curricular activities. We do a lot of things to make sure your child is ready for a future. And finally, the third amazing thing that we do is called Everyone's a Musician program, where every child in Fairview plays and learns one orchestral instrument. And here you can see one of our orchestral groups uh, that are formed, uh, that they won quite a few competitions already in Genting recently. Another thing that you want to know about us, the reason why our parents have faith in us is our, our many successes. One, 60% of all of our DP students receive scholarship offers when they want to go to university, partial and full. The uh, academics, we were the top and we are the top IBDP school in the year 2020. Um, and communication, 90% of parents feel that communication is frequent, delightful, and relevant. So many parents tell me that you know con having conversations with their school is like pulling teeth out because they just don't communicate enough. But I think that perhaps we communicate so much that our parents really believe that our communication is super good. Um, finally, I want to share with you our results from our DP. From last year, 30, uh, sorry, this year is 38 point average, which is amazingly high. Our 100% pass rate over seven years, not just one year, but seven years. All right, and we are the top IB school in Malaysia. So, any questions so again? How do we get going on this? Oh, we have a question actually in the chat box. We do, we do. So, from Eric. Eric, do you want to unmute? Would you mind unmuting yourself so we could uh, hear from you your question about? building the independence of a child yeah sure 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 thanks uh, Eric. I just, yes I, uh, I just want to answer if my child uh should, doesn't want to do something initiatively so how can i uh, get her interest to do something thank you eric we got that question uh eswari mrs eswari would you like to start and dr vincent can also add on to this uh yeah process. definitely uh, I think this will bring back to our first point, safe space and communication. So when we invest in the piggy bank of confidence uh, to get started, uh, I think this is very important. So when they feel safe, uh, they will initially start to take initiative. Mm. So if I can jump in. So in my previous life, I was a psychiatrist. So forgive my responses, Eric. It's a little bit psychological. Um, I firmly believe that no child can't take the initiative. Every child can. The question is, have they been trained not to do so? Are they afraid to do so? And is it in their brain when they calculate, is it better for them not to do so? Um, and the thing is, you know, a lot of the times if we scold our child and enforce consequences, you know, sometimes in parenting books, you have this concept called, oh, you must teach your child about consequences. Well, that's good. But if you overdo that, all you do is teach them fear. 
and they are afraid of the consequences. So if you do too much of that, that's not very healthy. The other one is if your child hasn't practiced uh, offering ideas uh, and doing things, uh, and sorry, offering ideas and offering opinions, then taking the initiative is a very strange idea to them. So maybe you can help your child do small things first. You know, taking the initiative to do things can be a very big project for a child. Maybe start them out with making small choices like, okay, what shirt are you wearing today? Or you know, what color shoe shall we wear today? Or let's do a parent child, same teacher day. Uh, what color shall we do together? So begin with small, tiny things to build up that confidence slowly first. And when that confidence starts building up, then you know we move on to the next step, which is how do you communicate with your child to encourage them to open to share without fear of being judged? Now, when you respond to people's opinions with their, their opinions, do you respond with that's a good idea or that's a bad idea? Because that's those two words particularly are very judgmental words. Or why do you think like that? The word why, be very careful of why as well. Why is a very threatening word. Um, well, try something like, what makes you think that way? Or how could we do this in a different way? Or have we considered this idea as well? Have you considered this idea? Or what about this? How could we do things together? So note the tone, the, the words that are being used and uh, invite them to make opinions and recognize their opinions. Recognition, the statements are, I think Mr. Suarez said it before, I like the way you're thinking about this. You know, sometimes you really need to just say things like that. I like the way that you're saying this. Um, I like your thoughts. That's a really interesting point of view. Uh, it's not my point of view, but it sounds great all the same. Saying these things to your child really builds up their sense of confidence and helps them appreciate that you're not going to attack them the moment they let their initiative out. Okay, so these are maybe some practical tips, uh, some words that you can use to actually make that happen for your child, Eric. Hope that helped for you. Eric, yeah. Anything else you'd like to ask about that point, that question? Is yes, that's, uh, uh, these are good points. Okay, and I think I need to uh, to pick up the uh, the, uh, the picky band first and build in the confidence to the to the kids so that they uh, so you can try to start something initiative. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you for your advice. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Excellent question, Eric. I thank really you for the question. Yeah, so yes, happy by just saying I'm gonna take it up. Uh, that's made our day all together by helping one person, just one at least. That that makes our ed educators' day every time, knowing that we made <laughs> thank, it. Wow! Well, thank you, thank you, Dr. Vincent and Aswari. Actually, on the flip side, I have a question here by a parent. Uh, perhaps on the on on the other spectrum, is is there a concern? I think the parent is concerned of over praising the child and causing the child's ego to be inflated, or you know, in some culture we call it big headed. <laughs> so, um, how do we go about that? You know, balancing between uh, putting in coins to the piggy bank, and you know, I I, I know as sorry, Miss Sorry, you you said I'm sure the parent also heard that you know the danger of having the coins go down because sometimes the child will need to withdraw from it so when they withdraw the balances go down right just like our bank account when we spend our money gets less so but what if i mean there's never a problem of too much money in the bank but you know is there a problem of too many uh, coins in the piggy bank of confidence for a child so perhaps just shed some light to us. I think it's probably cultural thing is, uh, for some of us. I mean, I can definitely relate to that parent's question. She asked something that I wanted to ask too. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Ms. Eswari, Dr. Vincent, Ms. Eswari first, ladies first. I don't think so. There is such thing as too much of praise. Yeah. For me, I don't think so. There's raising the effort. So you are not praising giving this positive reinforcement. We are actually giving them confidence. 
continue the I mean, like don't praise them for being inconsiderate or mean or anything that's just not healthy but if you praise them for being kind taking care of other people they're not going to grow up to be horrible people or big-headed because you've already trained them as such thank you is it is it me or is it my internet connectivity is laggy dr vincent and miss eswari yeah it's, it's running a little bit laggy unfortunately uh, apologies for that it could also be on my end Miss Shantini has a question. I think that that basically um, it's a, it's pretty much um, so parents. If you ever want to get in contact with us, yeah, parents, if you want to get in contact with us, please uh, take down these contact details. Um, do want to get in contact with us, and one of our lovely counselors will speak to you. Um, or if you want to contact me at all, uh, just ask one of the counselors to set up an appointment with, with any of the principals in the schools and with IB schools. Uh, and, we, and we are always happy to have a chat with you Indeed. openly and non judgmentally, of course, uh, just in theme with what we're talking about today. So, with that, everybody, thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with us. Have a wonderful day ahead. Um, be safe and be well. Thank you everyone for joining Bye. us. Safe weekend. Bye.